This is a radiological defense operations room, a nerve center for survival, which we hope we will never have to use. But since war could come, this room is ready, and so are others throughout the country. The USA, almost three and a half million square miles. And at the other end of our scale of size, tiny dust-like particles. They too have a name. And the name is fallout, radioactive fallout. A large-scale nuclear attack on the United States could produce a patchwork pattern of fallout covering two-thirds of the nation. More than two million square miles in a single day. In this two million square miles, more than 100 million people living well beyond the destructive range of blast and heat could be subjected to dangerous or deadly amounts of radiation from fallout. Carried upward 15 miles or more by the mushroom cloud, spread laterally by shifting winds at all altitudes, fallout from a single thermonuclear blast could severely contaminate a 60-mile strip downwind from ground zero, 1,200 square miles within an hour of explosion, 4,000 square miles in six hours. All of us, even in small towns and on farms, live within fallout range of a likely target. Furthermore, since these targets are often only a few hundred miles apart, fallout patterns can overlap, intensifying the danger. How do we know all this? From practical experience. A thermonuclear test in the Pacific in 1954 produced a highly contaminated area 20 miles upwind and 220 miles downwind with a variable width up to 40 miles, large enough to reach from Washington, D.C. to New York City along the densely populated eastern seaboard. In this 7,000 square mile area, there would be enough radioactivity to threaten seriously the lives of all who failed to take shelter before fallout arrived. Let's look at it in another way. Let's assume that industrial St. Louis were hit by a weapon with the explosive equivalent of millions of tons of TNT. Depending on winds, fallout could extend 40 miles into southwest Illinois in an hour. To Terre Haute, Indiana, 150 miles to the east in seven hours and to Wheeling, West Virginia, another 325 miles within 24 hours. Total drift, more than 500 miles. Mm -hmm. 
Civil defense tests have brought the problem into sharp focus. In one exercise, an imaginary force of 500 bombers severely damaged this country's key industries. Yet effects from fallout posed a more serious threat to the nation's survival than did the devastating but more localized effects of blast and heat. Let's examine some of the problems. Although most sources of water are located well outside of big cities, the wide drift of fallout could cause serious contamination of our surface water supplies. Fallout from a nuclear attack could gravely affect the nation's agriculture. Food supplies in fields or in open storage could become dangerously contaminated. Possibly they could be recovered for later use. But what about future harvests? They too could be dangerous if grown in seriously contaminated soil. Cattle, horses, and sheep might have to be kept out of pastures for a long time. In short, fallout from nuclear attack would threaten us with thirst and famine as well as with sickness and death from direct radiation. That is why our survival as a nation can depend on how well we prepare to defend ourselves against radioactive fallout. And there is a defense against fallout. Before we examine our radiological defense programs, let's take a look at the basis of the problem. As every youngster learns today, there is nothing new or mysterious about radiation. A Rentgen, which we call an R, is a standard unit for measuring radiation. In an average lifetime, a human being is exposed to perhaps a dozen Rentgens. This exposure comes from natural radioactive elements in the Earth and cosmic rays from outer space. The human body withstands continued exposure to small radiation doses. It is when the rate of delivery is high or the total dose in a short period is large that recovery cannot keep pace with damage. Exposure of the whole body in a short time to 600 or more Rentgens of radiation will almost certainly be fatal. People receiving 200 Rentgens or more in a short period of time will get radiation sickness. Those receiving 600 or more in a short period of time will die. For your protection, shelter is the answer, since highly dangerous doses can be produced by fallout radiation. This is what happens. Three, two, one. Fire. About 85% of a nuclear weapon's energy results in light, heat, and blast. But 15% of the released energy is radiation. This is of two types. The first, initial radiation, is emitted from the fireball shortly after detonation. Since for large weapons it generally does not spread beyond the blast area, initial radiation is of minor concern in the overall problem of radiological defense. It is the second type, residual radiation, that creates the fallout problem. Its production can be described simply. When countless billions of atoms in a large megaton weapon are blasted apart, Hundreds of pounds of highly radioactive material are produced. When such a bomb bursts at or near the ground, tens of thousands of tons of earth and debris are carried as high as 15 miles in the mushroom cloud. This tremendous cloud becomes a floating carrier which drops tiny radioactive particles back to earth. Where these particles land depends on a combination of three factors. One, their shape and size. 
even the largest, may be no bigger than a single grain of sand. Two, the height to which the radioactive cloud rises. And three, the direction and speed of winds at various altitudes. Fallout deposit resulting from the combined effects of these conditions is generally divided into three categories, close in, intermediate, and delayed. Close in fallout usually settles within a few hundred miles of the burst and reaches the ground within 10 to 20 hours. It is made up of the heavier particles in the cloud. Intermediate fallout descends within a few weeks of the detonation. Since the particles are small, they remain in the air for weeks, covering many thousands of square miles. Sometimes they are driven to earth by rain or snow. Delayed fallout is composed of very small particles that may drift completely around the earth several times and may not descend for months or years. Radiological defense personnel, RADEF personnel for short, are primarily concerned with close-in fallout. As you can see, close-in fallout is our real problem in radiological defense. And the problem becomes even more complicated because the speed, range, and direction of fallout depend upon ever-changing wind and weather conditions. Large particles fall fast and land relatively near ground zero. Smaller particles fall slowly, land further away. Winds, which vary at all altitudes and seasons, affect the pattern of these deposits. With winds variable at different altitudes, the spread of fallout will result from the effects of all winds acting upon it. For this reason, radiological defense officers cannot use surface wind direction alone as a basis for forecasting fallout. Radioactive materials decay with time. You might say they cool down. After all fallout is down and radiation has been measured, knowledge of decay rates permit estimates of how hot it will be days and weeks later. With this information, civil defense can estimate when it will be safe to evacuate or to leave shelters. Remember this rule of thumb. There is a tenfold decrease in radiation rate for every sevenfold increase in time after detonation. For example, a level of 1,000 R per hour at one hour after the explosion would be reduced to 100 R per hour seven hours following the explosion. At seven times seven hours, or in two days, the level would be down to 10 R per hour. At seven times 49 hours, or at the end of two weeks, the level would be reduced to only one R per hour. But remember, until decay reduces radiation to tolerable levels, there are only two safeguards against it. Distance, that is evacuation to safe areas, or mass, which is shelter. Underground shelters covered by at least three feet of earth or basement shelters of the types recommended by civil defense will give substantial protection. This is why we believe that most people who live beyond the areas destroyed by blast and heat can survive fallout if they will follow civil defense instructions. As serious as fallout is, we can cope with it through action as individuals and through an effective radiological defense program. An active program carried on by federal, state, and local governments. At the federal level, representatives of many agencies meet regularly to perfect methods of collecting and analyzing fallout information and to find the best means of advising our states and communities about fallout conditions after a nuclear attack.
An important part of the radiological defense program is a series of monitoring networks stretching across the country. A combined system of federal, state, and local stations, thousands in all, which will gather information on radiation levels as soon as fallout begins to spread downwind. On the basis of this information, transmitted by top priority communications of every type from coast to coast, early, effective action for our protection would begin at state and local levels. In some cases, evacuation. In most cases, shelter. The federal monitoring network at weather bureau stations, federal aviation agency sites, Department of Defense air weather service units and other government organizations operates on a round the clock basis. At every level of government, radiological defense units are being equipped and trained to act. Fallout forecasts, issued several times daily by Weather Bureau stations, will be useful in estimating local fallout areas if we are attacked. Certain stations gather weather information that is processed to give an estimate of the areas in the nation where fallout could be expected. Sent over a vast teletype network to civil defense and other offices throughout the nation, the coded information is charted on maps to show sections threatened by fallout. Lines on the map show where and when the fallout is likely to arrive. At all civil defense regional offices, radiological defense personnel help state RADEF staffs in their regions. Regional officers arrange for the distribution of training kits supervise the contribution of federal funds to state RADEF work, set up RADEF training in their regions, and coordinate RADEF activities of all federal agencies in the region. This is important enough to have our fishing copies in the right? And the Midwest is going to cause a rain out. Increasing radiation is testing here in Ohio and Western Kentucky. After an attack, the regional RADEF staff will collect analyze and evaluate all fallout information received from the states and will coordinate the flow of information to and from federal and state control points. The state RADEF people will use both ground and aerial monitoring units to make broad statewide surveys. entire highway systems and key transportation routes, major industrial and supply sites, as well as urban and rural areas, will be checked as rapidly as personnel safety permits. The state RADEF unit also maintains working maps. It plots and correlates data, analyzes reports. By transmitting its summaries, it links regional and local offices. But it is at the local government level that radiological defense will be on an immediate, down-to-earth basis. Local RADEF will perfect and test detailed plans for operations. Keep all equipment in readiness condition. Train and rehearse operating crews so they too will be ready. It will set up communications between its units and for liaison with state RADEF organizations. 
When an attack warning sounds, local survival plans go into effect. Monitors will report to their stations. The public will be advised to take shelter or evacuate. After attack, first reports of radiation measurements will come from sheltered monitoring stations. As soon as radiation levels permit, police, firemen, highway maintenance men, conservation officers, everyone trained to use survey meters will begin the vital work of getting detailed data to control centers. From this information, current situation reports will be prepared. Using these reports, RADEF officers can answer urgent questions raised by local authorities. Can short survival missions be undertaken? Is our water safe? What roads are safe? Are feed, livestock and crops contaminated? When can emergency teams begin decontaminating and reclaiming property? When will radiation die down enough to make it safe for people to leave shelters for brief periods and for utilities to be put back into service? Survival of whole communities can depend on the accuracy of answers given to these questions. Local RADEF plans also cover places where people work. Employers must shoulder their responsibilities by providing fallout shelters for workers. At work and at home, everyone must understand the hazards of fallout and the value of shelter. Every family must provide for its own survival for at least two weeks. Since radiation levels outside would often be deadly, fallout shelters will protect the most people. Both the underground and indoor basement shelters recommended by civil defense can be very effective. They must be stocked with a two-week supply of food and water. First aid supplies, flashlights, and a battery radio with Conelrad frequencies 640 and 1240 clearly marked on the dial should be included. Factories, offices, apartment houses, and schools all must provide shelters. Remember too that personal decontamination is important. Fallout particles can be brushed from clothing and washed from skin. All in all, a big program. Some of it in being, some under development. But it takes action to fulfill this program. Radiological defense training is being expanded. First priority, train more instructors at three national centers, in classrooms, on calibration ranges, learning theory and practice, more than 2,000 adult students each year are taking basic or advanced courses. Courses that will qualify them to instruct classes back home. A total of 600,000 monitors must be trained to make radiological defense effective in every community. To support this program, radiation survey meters are being distributed widely. These instruments, which measure radiation levels in terms of Rentgens or milliroentgens per hour, are the backbone of radiological defense. In addition to survey meters, dosimeters, instruments which measure total doses of radiation, 
are being distributed to the states and federal agencies. Radiological defense instrument kits for use in science classes are being distributed to 15,000 high schools throughout the nation. With the aid of this equipment, our young people will acquire a better understanding of radiation and will be better prepared to contribute to the nation's RADEF effort. Improved radiation measuring instruments and multiple purpose computers are being designed, built and tested. An intensive public education program to tell the American people about radioactive fallout and shelter is underway. For it is an informed public that will mean the difference between success and failure in meeting this threat. Informed people in homes and factories and offices must know their personal responsibilities for shelter and protection. Informed officials at all levels of government, from Washington, D.C. to the smallest town council, must understand the RADEF program and help make it work if the people of the nation are to survive. Charleston, West Virginia, KC, 0900, check. Our efforts now to build a workable radiological defense will pay off richly by helping to deter aggression and by saving countless lives if nuclear attacks should come. <laughs>